So I'm going to discuss some program that we've been working on for at least six or seven years, actually, and that we finished uh, with um, Rani Rod, who is here, Colin Guillermo, who is also here and giving a talk in Princeton tomorrow, and uh, Antti Kukkanen, who I guess most of you know, uh, mathematical physicist in Helsinki. And also recently, we were joined uh, by Guillaume Babrez, who's doing a postdoc in, in Berlin. Uh, on, on this program. So, um, the, so uh, what I'm going to explain is roughly uh, um, how uh, our program, which was to unify the uh, real conformal field theory. <clears throat> so let me first give you a, a bit of general context, which is historic. So um, the picture that one can have in mind is that on one side, you have statistical physics models in 2D uh, at, at a critical temperature. Uh, so this is, you know, this implies a probability theory, uh, roughly, okay, you can see these as, you know, discrete versions of, of Feynman path integrals. And these, these objects are, are expected to converge to what are called conformal field theories. And uh, so conformal field theory uh, in, in this landmark paper by Belavin Polyakov and Zamolodchikov, uh, it's uh, about you know, certain axioms that you suppose on the theory and, and then trying to construct them, etc. And these axioms are based on representation theory. And uh, essentially their idea is that you can construct and compute conformal field theories by a recursive procedure called the conformal bootstrap. So bootstrap stands for recursive. Uh, and soon after this work uh, in physics, uh, a certain number of mathematicians, including Gavitsky, who was uh, giving a lectures on this in 1999 here in IAS, you know, mathematicians started to, to themselves to write axioms, uh, to, to try to formalize this paper in a rigorous way, say. And uh, among these, there's a, there's, a, there's a vertex operator algebra introduced by Burkhardt Frankel. I won't discuss this here. We're actually trying to understand also this point of view, but I'm going to discuss Segal, who, uh, spelled out a certain number of very beautiful and, and natural uh, assumptions that a conformal field theory should satisfy. And uh, this talk is about, for Uville theory, we're going to you know, show how we can you know, implement these Segal axioms and how they lead to the conformal bootstrap. For, for, for one special theory, but nonetheless non-trivial, which is called Uville conformal field theory. So this is just to emphasize a bit what I said. So, you know, one side you have these discrete phys uh, statistical physics model and, and well, you expect them to converge to continuum versions of these things. You know, this is a discrete sum and these continuum versions are, are called path integrals. Okay, so roughly they're measures. So you, I'll be working in two dimensions in all this talk, but you can work in any dimension. I mean, quantum field theory is a, something that's uh, well especially interesting in four dimensions um so one should see these as measures on the space of functions of your of your manifold say so here we'll be working with two-dimensional Riemann surfaces to to r and so okay so an example of, of what you you want to do is if you, you take your function and you and you reweight this uniform measure on the space of functions you reweight it by an action, so it's going to be typically so gradient to the phi square. So this is the free field uh, action uh, plus an interaction term, say. So some function of the point. And we're going to suppose that, okay, usually you work with local actions, it means that you integrate something which really depends on the field only at the point x, but you integrate on your manifold. So equipped with some metric g, and I'll be looking at. A surface uh, sigma, and uh, when you want to, you know, compute things and and uh, and, and look at natural observables on, on the discrete side, you introduce fields that are going to satisfy special properties under this uh, this this measure. Okay, so for instance, you could, and this will be the case for Uva. You can, for a parameter alpha, say in, in R, you can try to see under this measure that you know. You have to construct because it's it's not at all given that this these kinds of infinite dimensional measures exist. You you can, for instance, look at 
you know, the exponential of alpha of the field at a point x. And then, you know, the name of the game is trying to compute how these fields at different points, they, they interact under this measure and it's called correlation function. So I mean, it doesn't get, uh, I mean, correlation functions is kind of one of the universal languages uh, in, in physics, biology. And, and so this is what you want to try to under, un, understand, uh, <coughs> understand. Uh, uh, Okay, so <clears throat> let me jump a bit to Seagal. So, so, uh, um, so first with the citation, so, so he's talking about his definition of conformal field theory. And uh, he says on, on, this, on this paper, the manuscript that follows was written 15 years ago. I just wanted to justify my proposed definition by checking that all known examples of CFTs did fit my definition. This task held me up, etc. So he had, you know, he had devised these axioms a long time ago, but he was lacking examples. And so, um, our, the talk I'm going to to to, to uh, today's talk is about constructing using probability theory, uh, Uville conformal field theory by by making rigorous sense of a a path integral showing, so I'm going to, I'm not gonna have time to go into the details, but I'm going to state essentially that this path integral construction we have, it satisfies Seagal's axioms. And then in the second part of the talk where, where Remy will be talking, he'll try to explain how by implementing these Seagal's axioms, we can recover the conformal bootstrap, uh, conformal bootstrap formulas that are you know, popular in physics. Uh, Actually, in physics, there was a small controversy on the existence of the path integral, and so they really work in this Belladine, this BPZ conformal bootstrap uh, formalism. Okay, so let me first state the Seagal's axioms. Uh, and then, uh, so, so Seagal's axiom is I'm going to uh, take, so um, B is going to be an integer up there. So I'm going to take B circles, say, and to, B, to, to these B circles, the joint circles, I'm going to uh, associate, okay, the, the B tensor product of a, of a Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space is going to be some L2 space on N equipped with a measure mu zero. And if I have no circles, uh, then it's just, a, it's just a, the, the, the complex plane. Uh, I'm going to associate to the empty space the complex plane by convention. And especially, so when I have a Riemann surface, I'm going to, so it's equipped with a conformal structure, and we're going to parametrize the boundary. Uh, I'm going to put a metric on it, and I'm, we're going to pair, and we're going to suppose that it has a geodesic boundary, and we're going to parametrize it by these B circles. And we're going to put on this surface marked points. And to these Riemann surfaces with marked points, we're going to associate what is called an amplitude, which is going to be uh, an element of, uh, of L2. So let me, let me, let me write this down um, with a drawing. So yeah, I'll give you an example. So I have my Riemann surface with boundary. So I'm going to suppose that, you know, I have a hole. So I'm going to put points x1 with weights alpha 1, or I can put a point x2 on my surface with a weight alpha 2, etc. Uh, so this is going to be x, the points, and alpha is going to be the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, etc. is going to be the weights. So I'm going to, as I said, parameterize by circles. And I'm going to, I'm going to have, say, this first uh, Boundary. I have a second one here, and I have a third one here. And okay, because it has a stronger uh, 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 geometric flavor, I'm going to actually tell you what is M. So, to each of these circles on the boundary of my Riemann surface, and M is going to be so. It's going to be functions of the circle to the real line. Okay, so. M is going to be some, some functional space. Of, okay, so I have, so I, I put on each of my circle boundaries, I put, I put functions. Okay. 
this. Yeah, right. But like everything's smooth, right? Yeah, everything's smooth. But the functions are, are not going to be smooth. Yeah, they'll be in some. They'll be in some so negative. So yeah, negative so this, basically. Okay. And so this is my amplitude. Okay, so it's A sigma phi one, phi two, phi three. That's okay. So Segal's axiom is uh, I have these Riemann surfaces and I, I want to put natural, you know. Conformal invariance conditions on them and natural gluing conditions on them. So it's very important that okay that you understand the the, the underlying object. So sorry, what what is what, you got M M E what M what is M M is a, is that manifold there with, with M, M, no no M M M M M is this M okay M is going to be H minus S so, so of, of of so so let let me call T. The unit circle. I thought M was a manifold. Oh, sorry, it's sigma. <laughs> sigma. Oh, I, I thought. Oh, no. So the Riemann surface in all this talk is sigma. Okay. M is okay. It's actually. Wait, wait. Is it a Riemannian surface or Riemann surface? Riemann surface with a metric. Yeah, we put a metric on, it and we suppose for the gluing to go well, we're going to suppose it has a geodesic boundary. Okay, but that's got a Riemannian metric on it right now. Later, later. Yeah, yeah, but we're going to work actually with conformal ones. Yeah, I understand that conformal will come back. No. <laughs> okay, and, and actually, just to jump in, so M yeah. is H minus S of, uh, of so the that's, circle. That's a Hilbert space. Yeah, so I'm going to equip. So M, 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 no, M is a measurable space. The Hilbert space is the L2 functions on M. So M is a, is our, is a space of functions. Okay. And I'm going to take a space of functions on these functions. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. So, so that's in the negative subplane space because it pairs with your. Well, your it wouldn't be L two. It would be L two plus or something. L. What is L two plus? No, no. I mean, it would be H plus S. Ah, no, no. But it's going to be negative. No, no. But I mean, to pair, no, it, it. to pair it, you have to pair it with something that, that is in H S. Wait. So. What, what, okay. So. What do I have to pair with HS? Yeah, maybe when you make the yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, okay. I, I, I still don't know. I, I want to know what MB is. I don't know what MB is. Okay. So M, M, M is going to be. Okay. Concretely, M is going to be. I think it's written here. I think B stands for boundary, right? B, B, yeah, it's number of it's, it's an integer. It's the number of boundaries. Number of boundaries. Yeah, so here B equals three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Three boundary components. Yeah. 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 Okay. So on each boundary component, I look at the space of functions from the boundary, say, to R. Okay. And I'm going to look. So this is this is a space, and I'm going to equip it with a measure. It's a measurable space. So if I equip it with a measure, I can look at the space L two. And 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 this so is and this is a transition function. kernel. This is going to be a function of of the three. Uh, so here it's the equal three of the three. So I take three functions on the circle, and it gives me an amplitude. So M is going to be sort of a direct so summary. Right? What is M? Okay, M is yeah H. So how do you say okay H minus A <laughs> tau? So it's if you want, it's the well, no, you got, it's the you got sum it. of it's the sum of phi n functions on the circle such that um, sum of yeah, but you got three of them in this case right oh so yeah i see what you mean you got the m to b but i haven't got the h yeah. yet. <laughs> so this is right it's going to be something it's going to be the, the, the set of functions on the circle and i'm going to equip this actually with the gaussian free field measure okay. the gaussian free field measure lives in a uh, no negative Okay, I, I was supposed to. Okay, everything. Just, just notation was computer. Oh. Okay, so. Yeah, so I mean, maybe okay. It's, it's because we're taking functions on a space of L two. Is I mean, the, the the measurable space is already a functional space, but you know, with probability. <laughs> so. Here are the geometric rules that these, these, these amplitudes are satisfied. So it has to be a, so if I take an orientation preserving diffeomorphism, it has to be invariant. So if I, 
if I so if I, I map my surface to another one, so I map it to psi, I can push forward, of course, the metric on sigma to this push forward. The points x get mapped to psi of x uh, by my diffeomorphism, and I don't change the weights. And the first axiom is that these quantities, they should be uh, it should be diffeomorphism in there. Okay. Um, and the second thing is I want veil covariance on these objects, which is to say that if I take a metric which is conformal to G, um, I get the same thing times two, two terms, one which is the exponential of some constant uh, over 96 pi times what is called, this is also sometimes called the Liouville action so, uh, in the literature. So it's a co-cycle, you know. And so what is it? I integrate on my surface with respect to my, my volume form, uh, the gradient of the function squared plus two times, so Ricci scalar curvature omega. So this is two times the, the Gauss curvature of my metric. And, and also this, the change in, implies uh, the points X in this following way. So these are, you know, these are really very important objects in formal field theory. These are, I mean, this, this encodes a lot of things. And it's the product of e to the minus delta alpha i, my function taken at the points x i. And so uh, let, me, let me write the value covariance because it's really an important property. G alpha is going to be so e to the central chart. So for those who, and I know some people here do that, huh? Look at the determinant of the Laplacian. Of course, this is true. This is true with C equal to minus two. Uh, so this is really the this is really what contains the conformal invariance. CL central charge. I put CL because I, well, we'll specify to view the little thing. Charge and the conformal weight. Okay. So you're seeking for, so in the Seagal framework, you're looking for these two properties. And then you have an essential one, which is the gluing, the gluing property. So the C is a, a parameter in his axiom. It's what? Parameter. It's a parameter. Yeah. So, but in, in, in physics, in, in great generality, it's, it's it can be complex. Okay. Okay. And delta alpha also are conformal. So. Okay. So, and the gluing rule is, is the following. So maybe I can read the. But, but let me write it down here. So. So let's say that um, I have my, my, my surface. So let me call it sigma one to, to match the thing. And let me call this variable phi, say. not phi three. So I have this thing here. Okay, so I, I have another one, another surface. So in my drawing, so in this drawing, there are no mark, let's see, there's just one mark point. Never mind, you can put one mark points there. Anywhere. Okay, so you have sigma uh, twos here. Okay, so your amplitude. So let me call this the, these fields phi three, phi four. And so what it says is that if you look at the amplitude of the glued surface, so you glue the surface, you get an amplitude. And so it's going to depend, depend on phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, right? And you glue them by, by identifying this. And so you get the integral over, so M, which is my, my negative index sub left space on the circle. So I, I just glue the two amplitudes. So I'm, I'm, I'm keeping implicit all the, all the other dependencies. A sigma two, phi, phi three, phi four, and I glue, sorry, according to my, my background measure. 
that I spoke on. So, so I hope this is this is clear. So it's really, it's really for those who who, who do probability, it's, it's very appealing. This is this is just a, a Riemann surface analog of a Markov kernel. Okay, this is a Markov semi group, but it's, it's instead of being indexed by the intervals, you're indexed by by Riemann surfaces. So you just glue them together. So that's that's the gluing rule. So then, so you're looking for something non-trivial with these three these three properties, and this is these are Segal's actions. So that's how to determine quantities just from that. Excuse me. The correlations that you were talking about, which are there. Yeah. They're supposed to be determined just by these numbers and these axioms. So they're supposed to be determined, yeah, by these axioms, but also by one important ingredient, we'll see that with the bootstrap, the, the three-point correlation function. Oh, okay. you, you, you can, you know, CFT, is, there's two things. There's, but this is later in the talk. Okay. Okay, so maybe, maybe uh, before, let me give maybe a bit of physics. So here, I, I've already talked about this. So I'm going to equip uh, my space of functions on a circle with a, a measure uh, mu zero. And so the negative, uh, this is the negative in uh, so what F space. And uh, let me try to explain where these axioms come from, from a, a path integral point of view. We'll see that it's rather natural. Uh, okay, so when, so I, I can, so by the way, okay, when, when, uh, when there's no boundary, okay, there, there can be zero circle, right? So it's a closed surface. In that case, you recover the correlation functions. And so, so what are what are the amplitudes? So you have your, your your fields on the circle, and you're going to integrate with respect to a path integral the product of your fields in different points. Those are the mark points, and you're going to integrate over all fields whose boundary conditions is given by these fields on the boundary. So you want to, so you take a path <laughs> integral. So you take a path integral, you integrate over all functions with the right with the boundary conditions given by your boundary fields. Okay, with respect to some local action here. Okay, that's that's the definition you want to give to your your, your amplitudes. That's what Segal had in mind. He had a path integral behind this stuff. And um, when there's no boundary, you just integrate over all functions on your surface with uh, with no boundary. There's no boundary, so you don't have to specify. It. Boundary condition. Okay, now if you do that, the mark points come in there. So the mark points are actually the the, the, the fact that if you look at. Okay, if, if there are no mark points, yeah, I see. It's a partition function. You just sum over space. But when you when you, and we'll see it's very true in Newville when you look at the correlation of fields at different points, then you're you're really looking at a surface with mark points. It's kind of like that. That's the now the physics heuristics is, is the following is that you see I, I wrote I wrote you a, lo a local action. Okay. So this is this is this is a, a this is a local action, you know, integral gradient plus v, etc. Because and the idea is that okay, you can split this. So you take a, a, a Riemann surface and you have a, a cycle which is separating the surface in two. Then you can split your action on, so this is, and you can split it into two Riemann surfaces. Then, then you can easily split your action here into two pieces. And then what you can do is you can disintegrate your measure, right? When you look at the space of functions on your Riemann surface, you can first specify the value of this field on the separating circle and condition on this and use disintegration. Okay, so if you do that, then you quite naturally see that you have this condition. I mean, so you have that the integral of e to the minus. So I'm, I'm not taking any marked points for this thing to, to be uh, simple. See, so yeah, I have my metric. I'm fine. And so I write this first by, 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 by integrating over my, um, over my, so m. My, 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 my function phi, so on the cycle, so 
call the cycle R, but and I I use this splitting, right? Define and remember I'm, I'm here I'm so I have to restrict to those functions phi which on the boundary, which on C are equal to phi. And I do the same thing here. So I'm, I'm running out of space to respect to d phi. So I get the same piece here, but on my, my second surface, the important point is I condition and so this is a one amplitude one, amplitude two. So this is the amplitude associated to my sigma one and to my sigma. So what I'm trying to, to, to explain is that just by cutting your action into two and, and disintegrating on the value of your field on the separating cycle, you naturally see these, that, that these, these things should, should pop out. So of course, we don't know what D phi is, but we, uh, this is just formal. This is formal. This is completely formal. And actually, what's going to happen is when, when you do this rigorously, you never work with the yeah. So you will need the fields on the, on the so, circle, but you won't need it on the surface. Uh, you, you said you're going to put the Gaussian field on. Yeah, but then I'm going to, I, I, we're going to, we're going to construct the thing on the circle, but we're also going to construct it on the, on, on the full surface. Another one. It's a it, it, Gaussian free field way. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> in place of by some axioms. Isn't that right? right. I mean, we're, we're not going to look at the measure. We've replaced the measures by some axioms. No, no, we're going to, no. Oh, we are going to this is what I'm doing now. We're going to construct all this stuff and do this rigorously. Siegel was just setting up the axioms. You're going to actually show that these can be satisfied by. We're going to construct the path integral. We're going to construct the amplitudes. And, and, and then we're going to state, okay, we won't have time to prove, but to state the results. So, and I'm going to try to, to explain to you how we construct these amplitudes. That's, I guess that's my job. And I mean, we'll more talk about how Seagal gets to bootstrap. Okay, so now I'm going to specify, I'm going to, 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 to work with a, a special action called the Liouville action. And since it's important, okay, I'm going to register this on the board. So what is, what is Duville? So Duville is, so this appeared in 1981. So Polyakov introduced this path integral in 1981 in his paper, Quantum Geometry of the Zonic Strings. So he, he introduced a, a formal measure of the form e to the minus this act, the Duville action defined. And what is this action? <laughs> Three terms. So on my surface with my metric G, it's, so there's the first term, which is the gradient term, the free field term. Okay. Plus, so Q, Ritchie scalar curvature phi plus the interaction term. Oh, I'm sorry. It is a, yeah, one, one over four pi. This is just for renormalization. Plus, and this is the interesting part of the theory. I have to integrate the exponential of my, my field on, on, on my surface. Okay, and we're going to talk about Uville today for gamma and zero two. Uh, and so there are two parameters, there's gamma and there's, so Q is related to gamma. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a redundant parameter. And mu is positive, it's, a, it's called the cosmological constant. So what, what, what we're going to do is we're going to define the amplitudes associated to this path integral. So in and, then, and then we'll be able to, you know, kind of not that, I mean, to, to, to derive all these things. So in one dimension, this would just be, you know, a Brownian motion yeah. and you would have a weight potential, which is e to the, uh, brown in motion. Brown in motion. Uh, that would be that would be it. And of course, you have this other linear term, which we need. Yeah. So the linear. So the linear term is really harmless. What is what is non what is not harmless is the non-linear term here because you know it's all the paradox at the end of, of these quantum field theories is you you can think that these fields are very smooth but they're going to live in negative 
uh, index double F spaces at the end. So you're going to have to renormalize blah blah blah, and that's what I'm trying to to, to I'm going to try to explain. Okay, so so if you want to uh, so <coughs> so first before um before talk, uh, before talking about how I define the amplitude associated to Liouville, let me give the Hilbert space. So I already gave it. Uh, so the Hilbert space that's going to, you know, that's going that we're going to uh, that's going to glue the amplitudes here. The Hilbert space is going to be just the Gaussian free field on the unit circle. So I take a trigonometric series on a circle. It's so it has a constant mode and, and higher order Fourier modes. So the constant mode is, is, is sampled according to the Lebesgue measure. And the other modes are the Gaussian free field on the circle. So, so the Gaussian free field is the root n over there? Yeah. So I take xn and yn, yn is standard iid Gaussian variables. I divide by 2 over square root of n, and I get the Gaussian free field on the circle. And I add a constant according to Lebesgue. So this is a random trigonometric series. Random trigonometric series. Right. Which has a nasty part because uh, it's, it's not a probability measure in zero. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that is called in physics. Okay, so physicists understood this a long time ago. So I know there's a physicist watching. <laughs> and uh, this is called the zero mode. And it's important because, you know, <laughs> but it makes things much harder because you're, you're, you're working with, a, with an infinite mass measure. So that's the Hilbert space that we're going to use to glue the amplitudes. Now, if I want to define the amplitudes, what I have to do, remember what is a, what is the heuristics I gave you in physics? I have to take, you know, the I have to, 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 to I have to, to to define, you know, I have to define this thing conditioned on boundary values. So let me define the amplitudes. So I'm going to take so I'm going to take a, 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 a so here sigma is going to be a, a Riemann surface with boundaries. Are you taking a Gaussian field on the surface? Yes, exactly. To define the amplitude. These things are kind of evaluating them. Or yeah. What, that's kind of tricky. Right? Yeah. So, so I take, I take a. Just so that I understand, when you when you make a Gaussian field, you always take one and square root the eigenvalue uh, at the in the denominator. That, yeah. That's sort of it. I, what I want. Okay. I, I want. Okay. If I want to make sense of so the idea is is is, 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 rather, is rather simple, okay? Is that I, when I'm going to define this thing? Okay, let me explain. Let me give you the general. Uh, I don't know if, you can, if everyone can see the general idea with Newville, okay, is that you can't rely on a background measure which is defined. So you have to rely on something, and you rely on e to the minus gradient square term d phi. So what you do if you want to define Newville? Is you split your action in two pieces, and you say that e to the minus s sigma phi j. It is the two terms, the two terms here. So minus one over four pi integral of q k j phi plus mu e to the gamma phi times the gradient part. So you see, if, if okay, I should put d5. If I'm to define this measure, I can always, okay, this is additive, right? So I, what I do is I, I, I split it into two, and I see this as the Radon Nicodim derivative with respect to this measure. And this measure, I get it for free because probability theory uh, tells me, it's been telling me for, for over 40 years, I mean, that, that this is the Gaussian free field. So it's Gaussian, I just have to know it's covariance, right? Exactly. So the Gaussian free field, to get the covariance of a Gaussian of a of a of a Gaussian measure, I have to invert the operator. So here the operator is the Laplacian, you know, because this is d phi square is Laplacian phi times phi. So I invert Laplacian and I get the covariance of this guy. And so inverse of the Laplacian is uh, the green function. So I take my Riemann surface with boundary and I, I look at the Gaussian free field with boundary conditions uh, zero, directly. 
I solve the Laplacian and I, I look at this series. So, uh, okay, so I, I take a, 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 an IID sequence, I divide by square root of the eigenvalues, eigen, uh, yes, values, and I multiply by the eigenvectors associated. This defines me something that converges in a negative index Sobolev space. It doesn't converge pointwise, and it, and it has covariance given by the Green function. This is just a can you have n bigger than one? Ah, uh, well, yeah, okay, it depends on the. No, that's not zero. <laughs> you don't have zero, but you don't have no, no, no. Zero. no, 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 no. This is okay, but I didn't say what was lambda zero. <laughs> First eigenvalue. Uh, in this world, <coughs> okay, we have to single out lambda zero. <laughs> no, lambda one. Okay, so I I, I, I I take out lambda zero. Okay, and so you know, okay, is that zero boundary condition, directly? Yeah, there's no boundary. There's boundary conditions. So, so I have lambda okay. Zero is so if yeah. this this is the definition, if sigma has a boundary, if sigma doesn't have a boundary, then we, we just take a Gaussian free field with average zero with respect yeah. to the volume. So I'm looking at boundary here, and so as you know. Uh, I, 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 everyone knows by heart that on the surface, the green function is the log one over x minus x prime when points collide. You know, it has a logarithmic singularity. So this field is not defined pointwise because if I, if I stick, if I, if I set x equal x prime here, I get infinity. And so it's only defined, as I said, uh, as, a, as, a, as a distribution. Uh, so now with this at hand, so I condition on my boundary phi one, phi phi b, whatever, and uh, I set this equal to the determinant of the Laplacian without the zero mode. That's where there's a prime minus one half times the expectation. So if I if I integrate a function of my fields, I I I, I integrate with respect to the directly Gaussian free field. So here we put far phi to stress that we integrate with respect to this guy and this guy is fixed. So I, I, my field on my surface with boundary, it's the directly boundary, uh, the directly uh, condition Gaussian free field plus harmonic extension of my fields, uh, phi, phi one, phi two, et cetera. Okay, so phi is the collection of boundary. What? Phi is the collection of field. Yeah, so phi is the collection of fields on the boundary, okay? So I, I have my, let's say I have my surface, okay? I'm writing it, it's not being well. So I, phi is phi one, phi two, phi three. So when I have my, my, my and so P phi, P phi inside my surface, sigma, it's the, the unique harmonic function, which is worth phi one, phi two, phi three on the, on the boundary. Okay, so I integrate on my Gaussian free field. And this corresponds to taking this integral and prescribing my field on the surface to be equal to these phi ones, etc. And now I'm okay, so now I have my principle that I explained is that you will, I'm going to use this and take this as a Hadon Nicodine derivative. And so I am quite naturally led to the definition of amplitudes. So, and Newville, the, the interesting operators are the, 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 the exponential valve for the fields at the different points. Okay, so okay, can you go back a second? We, we were supposed to integrate over all metrics. Are you showing us how to get? No, over all, all, all functions, uh, all functions of the uh, surface. Well, though. wait. Um, we put a metric on the We surface. put a metric, yeah. Is everything at, in the end, it's not going to depend on the metric, right? It is. Well, it's going to have this the dependency, uh, the veil anomaly dependency. It will. So we're going to, the answer will depend on the metric in some simple way through the, uh, I'm confused now. Like in string theory, you integrate over all metrics and then you get conformally. Yeah. So, so what are we doing here? Okay. So here, okay. Somehow you are integrating over all metrics because what's interesting is not phi, the field in Newville, it's e to the phi. Okay. So, so I mean, what what is really interesting is to to look at observables. Okay, I can look at each of those. Say <laughs> gamma phi. I put my background metric. 
the, 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 the new bill, this field phi, it, its real significance is really a conformal factor. So if I want to recover your, the vision probably that you have of, a, of string theory, uh, I, I only know what they what Fadiev and Popov did, which is kind of reduce the integral to a moduli integral, and then that's where I, and that's, that's at that point I can understand what they're doing. Up before then, I couldn't understand. That's Polyakov. Yeah, yeah. 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 So okay, phi it's a it's a random conformal factor, and what you're interested in is the exponential of this. But in this Louisville bootstrap a conformal field theory uh, you, there's a conformal structure that's fixed you're going to get an answer which depends on, on the metric g on the metric g through its conformal structure probably. yes okay so we're yes. fixing the conformal structure you will show us that it doesn't depend on the conformal factor somehow yeah okay, okay. exactly and exactly. there will be an answer as a function of the conformal structure yes Okay. When you're integrating in the conformal class, you're, you're sticking that you're fixing conformal class and yeah. you're getting an answer. The, so this label theory is in each. So you put a conformal structure and the label theory. Well, I guess it's in the it's in the title of the <coughs> theory. It's a conformal field theory. Okay. Yeah. At the end, you're you're okay. You're, you're not okay, concerned. You don't, you don't change a conformal structure. Okay. Well, somehow, somehow, you're not getting an answer. You're getting an answer that changes in a certain way. Yeah. When you change the when you change the map. Yes. <laughs> what what I'm what, okay. getting an answer. You're not getting an answer. You're getting an answer. No. It was a violent. Right. So there's a violent covariance. Yes. yes. With the goal. The goal is it's written there. The goal is to construct. Okay. So I have this random field. Okay. But I'm integrating it, and the goal is by using these these integrations to construct a function of. So this is essentially this is telling you this is a function of moduli space. Uh, uh, Equipped point. with marked points. Okay, so it's a function of a point in moduli space of curves of Riemann surfaces with marked points. You exactly. And uh, right, so you don't you don't integrate over the moduli. Okay. So no, 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 okay. no. Okay, that was what. No, no, in string theory you do. No, in, in conformal field. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. no, yeah, exactly. String theory is about integrating over all moduli space. Yes, in topology. Yeah, we're, 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 we're working at we're taking functions on moduli space. Okay, so uh, it's much more. Uh, you got much more information. Yes, it's yeah, much we, more we look at the deformation. So yeah, but when you deform the deformer class, okay, this will come. Uh, okay, so, so see now I have my definition because I, I so I know that uh, that the integral of the gradient square term is is, is the Gaussian free field with directly boundary condition. So I I, I, I take my two terms here. I take this term here and I multiply by pro 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 sorry, product of exponential alpha j, the, the random field taken at the points on my surface. And, uh, I, and I set this definition as an amplitude. And there's also a, a part which is, which is really a geometric part. So but deterministic. Well, essentially, OK, if I have a, a, a determinant of a Laplacian and a, a Dirichlet to Neumann operator. Here, which corresponds to cutting uh, surface in two, but this is deterministic. And I have a probabilistic part, which is this thing. So phi is the Gaussian free field plus a, a, a nice harmonic function. So this, this is a harmless guy. But what is not is the, the, the Gaussian free field here with Dirichlet. So you can integrate it. This is harmless. You can integrate the free field uh, with respect to curvature because this, this is okay. Yeah. But what is not okay is you have an exponential here. So you have to define the exponential of the Gaussian free field with Dirichlet, and this was done by Kahan in 1985, and it's called Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And it's funny because uh, at the same time that Polyakov started, you know, introducing this path integral, etc., Kahan was at the same time inventing, you know, the, the tool you needed to, to make this rigorous. And so, as you know, the Gaussian free field is not defined pointwise. So, how do you do? This is something that Tom knows by heart. You smooth it at scale epsilon with a smooth modifier, and you take the exponential, and you and you, it's a radon Nicodin derivative with respect to the volume form on your surface, but it won't converge. So you have to add a counter term when your ultraviolet scale epsilon goes to zero, and this counter term is epsilon to the power gamma square over two. And so Khan showed that if you do this, 
for gamma and zero two, you converge to something meaningful. Okay, it's a random measure which is rather wild. It doesn't be, at all behave like a, the standard volume form. And uh, if gamma is, is bigger than two, then it converges to zero. So there is nothing. So our entrance point via probability is restricted to this. Uh, to the, these values. This is why gamma is in zero. Two. <laughs> and so that's how you define this interaction term. And then it's kind of the same same game for these terms here. They're not defined pointwise, but you can you can smooth them at some scale and take epsilon to some powers of alpha. And okay, playing around with probabilistics probabilistic theorems, you can show that this thing is well defined using probability theory. Okay, and so. There is a condition on the weights alpha. They have to be real and smaller than Q, plus two over gamma plus gamma over two. Um, and uh, last thing uh, I want to say on, on, on this definition is that you see the geometric content of this, of this formula is that, look, if you, if you, what is phi? So exponential alpha j phi of xj, well, you can see this as exponential alpha j, the integral of, of the Dirac mass, right? Okay. So, um, so somehow you can, you know, at least formally, but it, all this can be made rigorous. You can take these terms and, and put them in the action. And it's, it corresponds to looking at, at metrics with conical singularities at the mark points. Okay, because, um, so it's a sum of, you can kind of put it in the action okay, formally. And, and, and so it, it really, it's really telling you that these, this quantity is the right to look at and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's about metrics with, 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 with conical singularities. Okay, and so I'm going to stop in like a, a minute or two and then let me talk and just, you know, state, state the theorem is that, okay, so, Using uh, renormalization and, and Gaussian multiplicative chaos, we define a, a quantity which depends so on, on boundary fields, marked points with weights, Riemann surfaces with metrics. And these, these things, which are a rigorous uh, uh, definition of the path integral, uh, they satisfy uh, all the Segal's axioms I told you, the three, the gluing, the veil covariance, <laughs> and the diffeomorphism invariance. Uh, and uh, so I have to restrict my amplitudes to the ones where the weights are bigger than the Euler characteristic of the surface times Q. This is to ensure that this is, you know, really uh, L2 functions. And you're going to define this on any compact Riemann surface. Yeah. Yeah. And so, of course, if, if there's no boundary, you get uh, the correlation. So you don't condition on anything on the boundary. And uh, and, and, and that's the thing you want to compute, actually. Okay, so so I have no partition function, here, right? I mean, no, in Uville you don't because uh, okay, uh, if you look at the, you, you have a partition function for Uville starting with genius <laughs> two. Okay, not here. But uh, we're working at any. So I mean, so the, the partition function of Uville doesn't exist for genius so uh, zero and for the torus. There's only a one point of function on the uh, You make you got this construction, very complicated. Not that you maybe you will say something about computing these things explicitly in some cases. But uh, what my question before was uh, does Siegel prove that if there is a theory, it's unique? Uh, are his axioms determined? In other words, what you construct is the only thing. No, it? no, it is not a unique. It's 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 okay. It's 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 so. In other words, these correlation functions better be you better be getting the right answer, right? <laughs> yeah, but so is that a theory? The thing is, you have okay, a conformal field theory. It's 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 fields <laughs> with weights and a central charge. Oh, so I have to specify. So for you, the central charge is one plus six q squared. And the conformal weights are given by alpha over two, q minus alpha over two. But this 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 does not tell you what is going to be the three point correlation function. It's it's something uh, that there are two inputs. You have this, but then you also have to specify a model dependent 
this is model independent, all this Seagal stuff. You know, it's uh, set of axioms. Uh, so this determines a three point. No. Oh. No, the Seagal axioms will not. The answer is. I'm confused. It's right. It doesn't the three points, but it doesn't tell you how to compute it. Ah, yes, it doesn't tell you how to compute it. Ah, okay, okay. It, it doesn't, but it doesn't give you the, the value. I mean, is this three point? Okay, it's, it's, like it's going to be determined. It's yes. determined by pair correlations, by two point correlations. So you're saying a Liouville theory is determined by more than just. These correlations? Uh, no, no, no. Yuga is completely defined by all these correlations. But um, uh, don't know, maybe, uh, what's this three? What's this magic three point that you keep on coming out? Ah, so this is I mean now. All right, come to the. <laughs> maybe we'll be. I don't know. Do you want Okay, so I'll I'll talk about the, the three point. So I'm, I'm, I'll change it. Um, so um, now now okay, we have all these axioms, and now we we want to go to. <laughs> We want to determine the conformal bootstrap. Okay. You want to compute this. Probably. Now we want to compute. We want to use these axioms to compute. Uh, and so the first thing we we had to do a uh, uh, few years ago is we had to. Uh, so there are two inputs in the bootstrap. Is that when you when you're a bootstrapper in physics, you 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 start by guessing three point correlation functions, <coughs> and then you apply a general machinery, recursive machinery. And so in physics, they had this uh, heuristic saying that this Liouville field theory, there was, um, so what is the three point? There was a, an explicit formula for these things. So what is this? You know that by the veil covariance and the, the veil covariance and the diffeomorphism morphism invariance, that if you look at the three point correlation functions on the Riemann sphere equipped with say the round metric, then you know by, by using Möbius transforms up to something completely explicit, it's, it reduces to, to, com, to computing it on at point zero one infinity. You just move the points around. That's not far. But <laughs> I'm finally followed. <laughs> and 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 then so this was so we have a construction of the three point correlation function using probability theory. And the first thing we had to do is to see that if it matches this formula called DOZZ that the bootstrappers, you know, inject. When they when they when they compute, and 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 this is what we proved in 2017 with Fanti, Pianen, and Remy. So this was the formula they proposed. So this is the the crazy formula, you know, or uh, you know, Edward Frankel has a formula for love, and. Uh, <laughs> so this is my love formula. Uh, so so if I take L to be the ratio of gamma of x, gamma one minus x. So this is the gamma function. Uh, you have what is called the epsilon <laughs> function of Zamorochikov, which is the exponential of this parametrized uh, integral. And so they propose that uh, the three-point function, which uh, uh, at points alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, is given by this crazy expression. Okay. So Peter, do you, do you know this epsilon function? <laughs> it's essentially familiar with the gamma function. <laughs> but it's, it's essentially the Barnes function. And that's very much related. Which Barnes? The many Barnes function. Oh, it's the one that's going to do this. <laughs> now the Barnes function, when you shift it, it's uh, double gamma. Function. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. These are yeah, I mean, the Barnes double gamma always comes in determinants. So I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of I think determinants in dimensions too. Now you get a you like just the determinant of the sphere, round sphere. Oh, it's a it's, it's a bottom stable gamma. Ah, it's a okay. So it's it's, it's kind of a okay, very, very very much related you, you, to the double zeta function to differentiate it. And so you have this this formula. So I'm, I'm I'm it's not the topic of the talk today, but we had to to check that uh, our three point correlation function. Uh, is, is, is given by this formula. And so in particular, you see that, so the theorem is that our three-point correlation function using probability theory coincides with this for real alpha i satisfying these, these bounds. <coughs> so the, the so-called, these are the, the so-called cyber bounds, you know, Nathan cyber bounds, because he had, he had derived these in some way in physics some time ago. And so it's always the same thing. Via probability, we enter the bootstrap with real values of the parameters. And, and, and this shows you that 
this this formula shows you that our the three point correlation function in fact can be extended to to any complex values of the alphas, and then all this is analytic. So when they get this by the bootstrap, are they doing it by this linear programming? Or was no, I think this is the older version of the bootstrap where you can like set up some recurrence relation and, and just get it explicitly. Get it explicitly, yeah. There is no linear program. So there's no there's no bootstrap involved here. Then? No, here not yet. This is the basis. Base. No, so this and so I'm I'm starting to go Maybe you start now. Yeah. Okay. So I think Hermie can continue. With. So then the, the the second part, which is but it, yeah. <laughs> so but I, okay. You said that you want to to see what uh, what this three point is so special. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this is the, the first slide after the, the bootstrap theorem. So if at this point uh, it's not clear for you, you stop me. Just before if you want. So so now we have the, the three point function, and the, the question is to determine uh, higher order correlation functions. And as you uh, observe, that you have this uh, anomaly formula that tells you that uh, correlation function are a function on the modular space with mark points, right? So my next slide is just, well, I, I will need to uh, parameterize this space of this modular space. So this is the, I want to look at the modular space of Riemann surfaces with M mark point and the genus H. Okay. So there are ma many uh, possible coordinates on this space. And uh, I want to just briefly discuss a stem of coordinates that is very well fitted to Segal axons. So it's, the, it's called the plumbing coordinates. So on a very rough example, without mark points, I want to explain. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this picture, but explain how it works. So you, you take, uh, you have a Riemann surface. You take a point decomposition of the surface. So we have a uh, two point, one here, one below. And uh, at each, at each uh, speaking pair, you will, uh, you will do an annulus, okay? This annulus is parameterized by a complex number Q. In the unit disk. So you take its modulus and it will give you the length of the annulus. And eventually you can twist a bit uh, the gluing with the argument, and this is parameterized by the argument of Q. Okay? So these coordinates were introduced in geometry. So I'm not <coughs> familiar with these coordinates than me, but they were introduced by Dolin Manford and studied by many people in geometry. So this, these coordinates have two. Uh, advantage for us. So first, you get a holomorphic parameterization of this moduli space. And uh, second, as we drew uh, pieces of surfaces, they are well fitted for Segal action. Okay, we'll see uh, later in the talk. But well, this is why we choose this uh, stem coordinate. And so, <clears throat> the, so here's the, all the physics conjecture about the bootstrap. So, here, uh, so this is an equality between two quantities. So this one is probabilistic. These are the correlation function Vincent uh, uh, introduced. So here the surface is closed. It's the surface is parameterized by these uh, two uh, parameters. So the holomorphic plumbing coordinates. You have fixed mark point on your surface. So this is a probabilistic quantity, and this is a quantity uh, uh, which involves a representation theory. So you have the Q is, your, is the parameter on your modular space. Yeah, this is the parameter on the modular space. Yes. <laughs> and eventually, also to make the gluing uh, work correctly, G may depend on you, but the G dependence. Okay. okay. So <clears throat> here you have two uh, two inputs. So the, the first uh, input row is a product of structure constants. So what does it look like? So is a three-point function? Yeah, this is a product of three-point function, but let me be a bit more specific. So row of, so just here you have an integration parameter. It, uh, it, uh, it's over this space here. So this, is, this uh, number is the uh, dimension of the moduli space. Uh, That's over the real point. Yeah. So this is the dimension. Actually, this decomposition depends on a, on the pan decomposition of, of your surface. From different pan decomposition, you, you've got different objects inside. Okay. So here, once you have fixed the pan decomposition, this row is a product okay, of structure constants, so the dose coefficients, uh, with 
with weights beta uh, what, uh, I1, uh, beta I2, beta I3. Okay, and all these weights they belong to uh, so alpha one, alpha m, and the uh, integration parameters p one, p uh, three, uh, three h minus three plus m. Okay, well, it's q q plus h. No? What? It's q plus h. Uh, sorry, yes, yes, yes. So it's uh, q plus i p one q plus i p. Uh, three edge minus three present. So actually, the, this product is explicit, but I just want to, to highlight the, the weights depend on the, the p's uh, integration variable and the, the weights alpha. Okay. Uh, so this is for, this is for the product of structure constants and the conformal blocks. So there, are, uh, the conformal block is this uh, function here. This is a holomorph holomorphic function of the parameter q. Uh, actually, this is a, a series. Okay, so is in Q. The, the coefficients are well. The coefficients only depends on representation theory. It's uh, it involves uh, the representation, uh, uh, well, the commutation relation of some Lie algebra called the Birasso algebra. I don't write any ex expression for this this series because it's uh, completely full. But you can compute it, compute the coefficient recursively. And actually, if you try to to, to show uh, that this series converges, it's uh, it's a mess. So uh, usually, uh, well, the convergence in mass of uh, this series is, is not known. It's a kind of generalization of hypergeometric series. Okay, but here the, the questions are a little, bit, a little bit more tricky, and it's uh, well, it's usually unknown that these series converge, except in cases where they are degenerate and uh, coincide with a hypergeometric series. So this is an output of our proof that for well, the corresponding values. Of the central charge in UV theory, this series converge. So, so <coughs> the boot, conformal bootstrap exists exist before you, and that is some theory which takes this Vera Sora algebra and its representation theory and uh, computes. Or what do they do there? They have some ansatzes and compute the same. Yeah, okay, so uh, what do they do? So, BBZ, they tell you that they tell, they tell, they tell you that. Uh, Correlation function are equal to this quantity. Okay, so now there is another approach in physics, which can be traced back to, well, to the H's. They say, well, uh, sometimes we don't have any probabilistic description of our system, so let's take as a definition this quantity. Okay, what do you know inside? You know the conformal blocks. The, yeah, okay. that's representation. Yeah, that's representation. You can define these guys. Well, there are issues related to convergence, but okay, let's. Just assume that uh, <laughs> you know that this integral depends on the pan decomposition. Okay, so you can you can say if if I have a correct uh, definition of my theory, then I can I have constraints because I, uh, all this pan decomposition should give me the same, same integral. So you have constraints, and once you know the constraints, you are supposed to well, if if you are a bit lucky, uh, they can. Tell you what are the structure constants. Yes. This is how BPZ. That's the bootstrap. That's the bootstrap, and this is how BPZ proceeded to find the minimal models. Actually, why minimal models? Because here you see this integral is very uh, well, it's very bad if you want to, to determine the constraints. Here you have a lot of constraints, but in some cases, for some CFTs, here instead of having an integral, you have a finite sum. And if you have a finite sum, it's way, well, it's, it's simpler to find the values of these constants. And well, it's a, in a very rough way, the CFTs for which you have a finite sum here are called minimal models. Okay. And basically, in mass, this is what uh, vertex operator algebra uh, look at minimal models. That would correspond to Ising model one, two, exactly. Ising and uh, yes, 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 yes. So, this is a yeah, this is a this is a kind of, kind of continuous uh, version of that because you've got yes, exactly, exactly, yes, 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 exactly. And uh, yes. So, uh, yes, this is just. So, you prove this formula in some ranges from your, from your probabilistic realization. Of, is that what you're saying? What's the theory? The theorem is that, yes, for uh, all the values uh, Vincent mentioned. So, right. under this, this uh, for all the values of these parameters, you can define uh, probabilistic. Uh, 
probabilistic expression for the correlation functions. And uh, they match the, well, the physicist prediction uh, for the bootstrap. So, so they are equal to this integral. So, so I guess, it, I mean, Brian, if I understood what you're saying correctly, once you know the three point function, you know the Virasoro algebra that, that it will give you these. Uh, this, uh, exactly. Then, then you can compute all. I mean, at least in principle, compute. In principle, compute. compute all these integrals. Because these integrals are not very easy to compute. No, but it's. Uh, I mean, it's a complete mess actually. Uh, to, I, 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 okay, if you just well, imagine for you will. Uh, well, imagine you have two point decomposition. And then for the sphere, well, you, you can uh, well. For the sphere, you have a. Uh, well, say you have four points. You can make a cut here, make a cut here. You have a representation theoretic expression for your blocks, and then you plug this quantity and see if, if the two uh, decomposition match. Well, okay, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so it's simpler when, well, for, for minimal models, uh, the blocks degenerate uh, usually to, uh, uh, to either geometric series. Yeah, and, uh, okay. and even even in that case, actually, even in that case, the the proofs. Uh, I mean, in vertex operator, in the world of operator uh, uh, vertex operator algebra, they can prove the bootstrap construction, but only in, in genus zero and one. So even even if you simplify the model, it's not completely obvious. So. Okay, so but now uh, he wrong told us that he's about to produce a proof. For minimal Sorry, models. So, and at what point did you guys generalize from the three point correlation function to the endpoint that you have here? I'm sorry, I did not understand the beginning. Uh, from what point did you guys generalize from the three point correlation function to the M point? Because you don't have a three point, you have a random point correlation function that you're showing. but. Previously, you guys only showed the three points, so that's what I'm wondering. This this step. Okay, uh, last slide was about uh, three points. Right. Now, here you can take uh, as many points as you want, and recall also that the three points were on the Riemann sphere, and here you can choose uh, the any Riemann sphere with uh, the genus you like. Surface. Yeah, sorry, uh, Riemann surface rate. Right? This is an identity, uh, and the, the three comes from this product of structure. So that this now is a, and the F is known also. So they're proving an identity that this was in the literature before. Yes, sure. Uh, in physics, uh, yes. I mean, the theorem is, let's say, giving a, a probabilistic content. Right. It's mapping not, not right. all this to probability, right? That's that's the, the okay. Yeah. I saw the convergence on the right hand side was not proved, and, and yeah, but the, the crossing yeah. symmetry was not proven. Even in physics, I think that there was <laughs> for instance, the, the convergence of the, now you become the real yeah. spokesman for physics. Uh, yeah, the convergence. Uh, he does. Uh, he, 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 yeah. I thought it is like the, the convergence is proven in the physics side, at least in the way. Yeah, but the with Nekrasov function function. Which yeah, that's, does that's, not match yeah. this value this year at the, the torus. Yeah, yeah, for the torus. Yeah. And, uh, and they use Nikrasov. And this is not the same. Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also, uh, the crossing symmetry, so, I mean, the, for Uville, the, the fact that the, all these integrals match, if they do it uh, numerically. There. Yeah, on this, basically on the sphere, yeah. <coughs> OK, so now I want to try to give you a hint of the proof. So, and this, but on my first slide, you will see how the Riemann sphere with three points. Right? So uh, basically the, the idea is, uh, well, let's start with, uh, it won't work, but let's see a, a simplified uh, situation. So let's say that I just want uh, on a simple example, the partition function of this, of this surface. So I take, uh, I choose a point decomposition of my surface. And uh, so by Segal, I can see this the surface as the gluing of these two points, right? Okay, so uh, imagine, uh, you can, imagine I can find the basis of my Hilbert space, the, I call this family uh, Psi P, which is made up of uh, this amplitude with special values of the weights here. Instead of having a, a real weight, I take a 
a complex weight, but let's imagine that I can find this this amplitude by this is the orthogonal basis for the for the L two the L two theory on the of the boundary, right? This is what? Yeah, this is orthogonal for what space? Oh, okay. You have a new that space, the no, inverse space, uh, Vincent. Uh, uh, the, the, we talk, uh, sorry, uh, yes. Yeah. Corresponding to the bound. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. H lives on the bound. Yeah. So imagine. And zero is the mark point. Yeah, sorry. This so you have the disk uh, in fixed metric, fixed metric. You have uh, one mark point at zero. Okay. And uh, you, you choose this weight. Because yes, I will explain perhaps a little bit later why this way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused about what the space system lies in and how you. Uh, so it's an it's an L two of the of the one of the circles, right? Yes. This L two an L two of the function on the circle. On the circle, yeah. Equal to the Gaussian measure. Yes, yes. On that. Yes. Yeah. That's the Gaussian measure. So for for now, what's the what's the Q? How does how does the Q have? The Q is the this one. Uh, the Q is this parameter here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I will just try to play with finding a, a basis of my field bar space. But the the first step I, I will well this is just a, well an assumption. Imagine you can you have a basis like this. Okay. And uh, it will it won't be enough in the end. But let's. I just want to explain how the the three points uh, showed up. So we, we have a basis, a basis made up of this amplitude and with complex weight. And OK, uh, complex weight, uh, Vincent uh, didn't tell you how to construct that, but th this is a story of energy consideration in some way. But let's just imagine we, we have this, uh, this amplitude. OK? If you have a basis of your Hilbert space, what you want to play with is the Planchel formula, right? So uh, you have a Planchel identity on your Hilbert space so that you will uh, plug the Planchel identity at each uh, splitting curve, and you will end up uh, with uh, this decomposition here, uh, which just corresponds to uh, three times the, the Planchel identity on the, on the splitting curve. So, so here you see that you have a point amplitude evaluated at those eigenstates, at, at those uh, elements here. So what happens here? Um, so let's compute this this amplitude. So you have a pump. And here you 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 evaluate this point amplitude to these eigenstates, but these eigenstates are disk amplitude. So basically, Segal tells you that you are gluing a disk with one mark point at each end of the point. Okay. And if you uh, do the gluing, this is a sphere with three points. Okay. This is a sphere with the three points. So if you are if you had that your basis, then all the coefficients here are just those coefficients. Okay. So you see, uh, in the end uh, of the day, the, the argument for the special role of the Riemann sphere will be the point decomposition of Riemann sphere. Okay. okay. So actually, the, the situation is a bit more complicated than that. This, this uh, family is not enough to diagonalize the space. Okay. So to construct a complete family of the Hilbert space, uh, this will take a representation theory and the representation theory of uh, an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, which is a Lyrasov algebra. And uh, that's uh, what I want. So, uh, and this Lyrasov algebra, uh, uh, well, I mean, it will construct a complete family of your Hilbert space. And this will be also the spectrum of, of some special of, of operator on your Hilbert space that I want to construct now. So how will this operator is called the Hamiltonian of UV uh, CFT? I want to explain the construction of this Hamiltonian with a geometric, uh, just a geometric construction of this Hamiltonian. So to construct this Hamiltonian, I want to look at the semi-group. And actually, this, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian will be the generator of the semi group. So, to construct this semi group, I look at the annulus. Okay? So, you have uh, two boundaries for the annulus. 
And uh, so the amplitude of this of this annulus has uh, two boundary fields. So let's uh, what? okay. You have the the field phi here the, on on this boundary. You have this phi here, and on this boundary you have this phi prime here. And you can see this amplitude, which depends on two boundary fields, as the integral kernel of some operator. Okay, so it's kind of a propagator if you uh, take this definition. And that actually, you can, well, the idea uh, to see why it's a semi-group is very simple. Well, the idea is that if you glue uh, two annulus together, then you get, just get a bigger annulus. Okay, so it's, uh, it's semi-group. Okay, so you can make this computation. And uh, you made it by co-author Ralph Phillips, very happy. Sorry? <laughs> my co-author Ralph ah. Phillips from many years ago, my teacher. From many years ago, wrote the book on semi groups with Dilla. Um, he would have been delighted at this point. <laughs> with the semi group. Structure, though. This is really yeah. right. now, but, uh, the generators of these are kind of tricky, very tricky. Yeah, but well, these are these are your hands on as a filter. Right, but I assume these are not unit filters. No, that's not exactly. Yeah, and uh, what I like is that this construction is very geometric. I mean, you can explain why it's the geometric uh, group only, only with pictures. Okay. Yeah. So now, same same game. Uh, just uh, try to see why these amplitudes are eigenstates. So I apply the semi group to a disk amplitude with one mark point, and what what do you get if you so you by Segal you just glue these two pictures together, and what you get is just a bigger disk. With one mark point inside. So basically, you know that the disk amplitude should be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Yeah? So actually, well, this is the construction of the Hamiltonian, but we have a, a more general picture with, with, uh, with Guillaume Bavrez, who is online. Well, to see that actually we constructed one uh, uh, operator here, the, the generator of this, uh, this uh, semi group, but there is a more general picture. Well, basically, amongst uh, instead of playing with the shrinking circles, you can play with a uh, flow of holomorphic maps on this disk and construct this way a whole family uh, of operators encoding all the symmetry, uh, all the, the, the algebra of uh, symmetries of our model. This, this, uh, this family of operators is the Virasso algebra. And actually, we have two copies, two representations of the Virasso algebra. So what is it? So we have two copies. So one for the first copy and the L tilde N for the second copy. The, those two representation commute. Okay. Uh, they are unitary in this sense. So the, the adjoint is the, so this relation. And the commutation relation of the Virasso algebra is this bracket here. Okay, here you have the central charge. So CL is uh, this quantity here, one plus six Q squared. Okay, so, so we have two copies of these operators. And actually, um, we will see how this, uh, how this uh, whole family can help us in constructing a, a nice basis of our Hilbert space. Okay? To get a basis, we have a first theorem, uh, which is purely analytic. Uh, I mean, uh, we can, we can uh, find a, a family of uh, eigenstate which diagonalize, uh, diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So this family is indexed by uh, P and the Young uh, diagrams. Uh, so what are Young diagrams? So Young diagrams are just uh, finite sequences. Finite I think this. What happened to the semi group? This is H. This is generator. Uh, H generator. So yes, what, do what do you know about H? So you're now telling us something about its spectrum. Yeah. So uh, H, H. So okay. H is a is a is a self adjoint. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's a self adjoint. And actually, we have an expression for H. Expression for H. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 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 Well, yeah, you said the key word itself. It's also a zero. It's also related to the Virasoro element. Yeah, well, but since I didn't give, uh, well, you can recover H by just applying L0 plus L0 tilde. Ah, okay. I don't know if it, it helps. Okay, so this this H actually it's a well, it's a it's an, an infinite dimensional operator. Basically, it's a, it's a sum of a, if you remember the, the Fourier series, it's a sum of Laplacian on the zero mode plus. Uh, 
sum of uh, independent harmonic oscillator on each other mode. And then you add uh, a nonlinear term, which is uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos on the circle. So this term is very singular. But uh, maybe even uh, maybe you say a bit more on this uh, scattering theorem tomorrow. Okay. So this this this, this, this theorem is a very uh, big uh, part of work uh, actually in our work. But anyway. What I want to say is it, it's that it's just analytic. So we just have the existence of some family. And for this family, uh, we have a Planchel identity. I just want uh, to, to mention that uh, young diagrams are uh, decreasing sequences of integers, finite uh, sequences. So here, they are indexed by, by Two young diagram, diagrams, and this young diagram so will be related to the DRS algebra. Uh, here we have some terms which are maybe unusual for the uh, identity. Actually, this family is not orthogonal. For different P's, uh, these guys are orthogonal, but if you take the same P but different young diagrams, they are not orthogonal, and these coefficients here are uh, just, uh, just uh, Gram Schmidt coefficients. Okay, so this is called the Chapeau of, of form. And uh, you can compute this uh, sharp value form only with the DRS algebra. But only what, with what? DRS algebra. Uh, commutation relation. So, yeah. Okay, so this, this, uh, this theorem diagonalizes your Hilbert space, but you don't know anything. It's analytic. You don't know anything about the structure of the spectrum. Okay. Uh, so uh, if, if you want to. Uh, what do you mean? We know the spectrum, right? The spectrum right? uh, is absolutely continuous. Yeah, eigenfunctions, functions, sorry. But you have, oh, oh yeah, you know, you have science for science. Exactly, but you you know asymptotically what it's like. Yes. You know asymptotically what the sides are. Yes, in the zero mode. Yeah, okay. Are there any bound states? Uh, there are like Eisenstein series for, uh, for the modular surface, basically. Yeah, maybe this is related uh, with this picture. Okay, so we, we have the spectrum line here. So actually the first, the first thing we need, and maybe uh, Colin told us the story about the, the Planchel identity for SL2, uh, et cetera. So I think uh, I more or less understand this theorem since he, he, he told me the analogy, analogy. So maybe for you, if you know, you can go the reverse way. Okay, the, the picture is the following. Uh, we have this eigenstate and they admit an analytic continuation in the parameter alpha. Okay, so this is the, the complex plane, and this is the parameterization of alpha. If you are on the spectrum line, Q plus IR plus, this, is, uh, this psi alpha corresponds to the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay? But you can extend these states analytically to, some, to the complex plane, and there is a region when uh, alpha is on the real line, well, we have a probabilistic expression for these states, okay? So for these states, uh, we can show that indeed the analytic continuation corresponds to the disk amplitude I was mentioning in the beginning. Okay, so the eigenbasis, so and the, these states, uh, the disk amplitude replace the role of highest weight vectors, okay? And still using a probability theory, we can show that the other uh, eigenstates are, can be generated from the disk amplitude by the, the action of the Virasso algebra. Okay, so this is a very uh, important part of our work, playing with this analytic continuation, making computation in the in the region we know. Improving identities there, which then analytically continue. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And this is something we, we have to do very often in our work, switching to poly to make computation, switching back to the spectrum line to get correlation on the eigenstate yeah. and so on. Okay, so now I just want to, to recap. What I did. So, uh, for the reason I mentioned a bit before, the, what you want to do is to compute the bound amplitude on the, this eigenstates. Okay. So here, what's annoy, annoying here is the, the fact that the, the parameter is complex. So the first thing you do is to uh, analytically continue to real values. And as I said a bit before, when you analytically continue to the real values, these are this amplitude. So this corresponds to the Okay, to the picture upstairs. Okay, you just load this to the pound to get the, the, three, the three points here. Okay. This is not, and actually, uh, if, you, 
do some work, something similar appears when you compute the point amplitude to the descendant field. Uh, well, you have to switch to the probabilistic region, express the, the, the action of the Vira Soro algebra in terms of partial differential operators acting on the three point function. You make the computation. Then you see that uh, you have a further term coming from this uh, descendant contribution. And still, in the end, the, the dose coefficient. So basically, the, there are some, com some computation, but this is the, the idea. And then, in the end, the, the last, last step. So if you, if you come back to the proof I mentioned at the beginning, so you have your point de decomposition of your surface. You see it as the gluing of two points. Then you will insert the partial identity between the, 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 the curves. It will give you. Uh, this, this formula, so this is the pairing of the two points. You insert the branch shell identity. Here, these are just the, the chapeau of a lot of terms, the gram schmidt coefficients. And here, you know that up to some factors, okay, these are those. <laughs> okay. This is what you get. FP, FP squared here is just the sum of all the contributions coming from the descendants, okay? But there is no Q for now, okay? Well, does the Q come from? The Q actually, uh, as I said, when you uh, oh, here, this is just a cut of a surface. What happens if we glue and annulate between the, the curves, between the points? Okay. What what happens is that you will uh, just glue uh, a dis, uh, an annulus amplitude at each at each splitting curve. Okay. So you will have your two points. And if you move uh, your surface in the, in, the, in the space of uh, the moduli space, okay, you have, you have point one here, point two here. Well, my points are a little bit not conventional. And here you have an eye, okay? What happens here, so by SEGA, you just glue uh, annulus amplitude in between. And the uh, annulus uh, amplitude are related to the propagator, right? And actually, uh, there is also uh, another operator, which is the generator of, uh, for rotation, uh, parametrizing the twist. So there is another operator. So the the T here is actually uh, the modulus of the annulus. And uh, you have the argument of the annulus here. Uh, and when you apply these operators, you can uh, diagonalize them together. They commute. And you can, you can prove that actually this, these guys uh, are eigenstates of these uh, operators here. And uh, you have an expression. So there is uh, the conformal weight of the P, but there are. Uh, Sorry, uh, you have the uh, monomial in the Q appearing here. So this is why, why when you further plug and light here, you get a, a, an anomorphic function here. Okay. Thank you, TG. Oh. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes, okay, but I'm done. Okay. So you constructed this, you've shown the truth of the axioms are satisfied by the way you constructed, and then you are able to use that to prove certain identities. Yes, that come uh, that are related to a, a purely algebraic way of computing these things. Uh, the bootstrap, what does the word bootstrap mean? Bootstrap, uh, well, bootstrap, it's a, you can, you can, uh, well, you can start, this is a, you can, well, this is just the idea that uh, you can compute a higher order. Yeah, from three points. From three points, yes. Okay, and, uh, and uh, it, it seems like by the probabilistic interpretation, you're able to, you, you sort of have to analytically continue these expressions. Yes. Then you give an interpretation 
And then you get, uh, uh, as a consequence, those identities are proved. Yeah. So it is an analytic continuation argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the reason you can do this analytic continuation is because the past is definite, because you have a, a Hamiltonian, which you can, because you have to turn time to, to imaginary time. Or yes, 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 yes. You can. That's, that's, that's the mechanism. Well, I, that's, that's one. Uh, and it's, it's a huge amount. No, it's because it's the, well, the only to know the disk is an eigenfunction of, the, of a certain self agent operator. Yes. And then you use spectral theory, scattering theory, a little bit like for a modular surface, you prove a, an Meromorphic extension of the Eisenstein series yep. by some thread on argument at some point, and we have to do this for this infinite dimensional like case. So, on where, where is it? So, there's so is it in infinite dimensions like this? Sort of hard to imagine a thread on operator anyway. Where, where do you get the compactness? Yeah, that's a lot of work. <laughs> it's, uh, is that what you in some sense, there is, if you want, there is, there is scattering, but it's only the scattering is one dimensional somehow. So, it's a bit like a, you have maybe you can write the operator. It's like the Laplacian on the real line, which is the zero mode of the field, plus a, a sum of harmonic oscillator. And these guys have discrete spectrum, plus a potential. Then uh, it's, it's to be like a scattering in one dimensional coupled with a, 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 an operator which has discrete spectrum. That, that, uh, that's the Hamiltonian. But this, no, this no, no, the 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 many the 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 uh, yes, this, yeah. So you have uh, yes. So you need to work on weighted space and think maybe it's a, a little bit like for a hyperbolic yeah. phase with cusp. But that's really more complicated because uh, the potential is especially quite yeah. nasty. It's it's very singular. So it's uh, it's even not a potential in some in some cases. It's not a function. It's a, it's a kind of measure. Yeah. What is nice maybe is that. We have often to interact between probability and analysis. Otherwise, we cannot complete the picture, right? So, so what did you say about the analytic continuation? It, it isn't just the fact that, you're, that you can you know, take e to the minus t and, 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 and make it either. do that. That's, that's no, no, much no. more than that, right? Yes. Sir. So, yeah, so, yeah. so, so how, do, how, do you, how do you see the analytic continu continuation in this language? When we prove uh, the meromorphic extension of the resolvent of the space. Yeah, so they're doing this kind of. Scattering theory. 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 But there's always uh, some compact operator somewhere. Otherwise, you can't get to finite dimensions. So we use yeah, well, basically you, you construct you construct an ansatz if you want, yeah. uh, which is like the free field in some sense. Like you remove the potential. Yeah. Then, and then you can do it. Sorry. Then you can do it, right? Yeah. The the, the, the everything is explicit. Yeah. Yeah. So this thing is sort of a compact perturbation. Yeah. And, and then you get you apply your ansatz, then you get okay one. Okay. It's like the identity plus a narrow term, and and it's compact. Try to make it compact. Okay. But but that's, that for this case, it's uh, really not easy. But the, the, is there some, uh, as Peter is suggesting, is there some compactness here that you need or not? I don't think you have For the discussion of compactness, yeah. that's, that's what is difficult. Yeah. We need to work in weight space. So you, you, you have to work in weight space, but, yeah. but and, and use a lot of, of we need to use a lot of estimate on this potential. Like there are probabilistic estimates, like uh, lower bounds and moments bound and things like this. I see. And we use the fact it's positive, so that's very important. No, that's, yeah. that's a crucial thing. And, and uh, since we have you guys here, uh, the, when you guys do the linear program on this, you don't do it on this sort of thing? Uh, so mostly we are interested in where the spectrum is discrete. 
here is a continuum spectrum. Yeah. And I think that like the way you we use the word the conformal bootstrap is boils down to basically you have some Riemann surface and then you can cut and glue it in different ways. Yes. And this different glue, like different way of cutting and gluing should give you the same result and that puts some consistency conditions on whatever that runs in that annual. Does that give you bounds on the parameters or nails down the parameter? Is it uh, so in in so when you have a discrete spectrum, it gives bounds on the on whatever stuff that runs in that annual line and also on these three point structures. That's and bad. I think people have also done uh, like numerics specifically for this uh, legal theory. Yeah, recently. Recently, I, I guess one of my collaborators in the Peter Krapchuk was in that paper. Right. And there, I think they can nail down this DOZZ formula very well. Like the, the bootstrap, tells, the numerical thing tells you that the three point structure has to take this form. It might be a magic situation. Yeah, yeah. But they have to input some information about the spectrum. That you know this uh, of course, you were, you were at uh, Dalal's uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so when uh, that's sort of incredible when a linear program actually gets you the exact answer. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of remarkable. Yeah, what is funny is that they, they do little, little assumptions on a CFT the hostile algebra, central charge bigger than one, something like that. Yeah. And they do their bootstrap and they it gives constraints and they recover uh, DOZZ. Right. So, uh, it's, it's, and as you know, it recovers, as, as uh, Mazak showed, you, you showing that in this other case, mm -hmm. uh, they recover um, via Sobska's work, ah. uh, sphere pack. I don't know that. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Then. They explain what uh, it's a similar uh, linear program with ah, okay, okay, okay. So I, I think one of the remarkable things is when when does this kind of magic happen that this infinite dimensional linear program actually nails the thing completely, not just approximately. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. They've now found half ah, of this stuff. They, okay. They're running this linear so program far. just in the yeah, ordinary Bogman yeah. case, not Vera Solar. Okay, okay. Vera Solar, yeah. Vera Solar program. Okay. And they, they get uh, extremal values for certain exact values for certain. Okay. Uh, but right. those are presumably has something to do with integrability, as we sort of speculate. Uh, uh, it seems that. Uh, yeah. In what the, these guys do is they run the linear program and magic comes out. Then you have to. <laughs> So in the surface case, like the, all the bounds we have, they are saturated, and all the surfaces we saturate the bounds, they are arithmetic surfaces. So they are in some sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, then I so then you can set up the bootstrap program so that you rule out these surfaces and then hope that something else would come up. Like, but then looks like the, the <laughs> programming gives you some bound. Yes. Uh, which is slightly away from the nearest non-arithmetic yes, surface. But you would expect to be. Yeah. I was a bit sad, but some Peter was saying that it should happen. But, uh, I think <coughs> and this is quite quite amazing. So what are you going to say tomorrow? Just as a preview. Uh, I think uh, I'll talk about this and then <coughs> I'll, I'll speak a bit about the Hamiltonian as well, like more analysis part. You're talking about the Allen continuation, or I, can, I, can talk about yeah, it. I, I guess that's important, right? And scattering, we didn't talk about the scattering picture. So I need to introduce also background because I. Don't know. So, I have some questions, though. I have a nice question. Is it manifest from these formulas that, like, the fact if you, you can cut and glue the surface in various ways and you would get the same answer? Yes, yes, it comes from the. It comes from the proof because we start with probabilistic representation. Ah, ah. We start with the probabilistic and then we we get the formula by decomposing it in several parts. Yeah. Okay. But because the object. Uh, yeah, what's very nice here yeah. is that crossing symmetry and all stuff like this is open field kind of. Because, because yeah, this expression does. Yeah, it's for free actually. Yeah. It all does. Yeah. On the left, it's well defined. So yeah, on the right, it does depend on the path. Mm. And we do things uh, on the reverse way in physics. You yeah. know the passive yeah. integral, so you try to guess what it should be by this formula, but then you have to prove it's consistent. Yeah, yeah. We start from the passive integral, which makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Then we we'll prove the formula. So, so I'm curious to know in what generality does your framework apply? I mean, because you took the Louisville action, but I mean your arguments for I mean your starting point for your starting point for trying to make sense of 
the reveal action, which is was to split it into basically a Gaussian free field component and some functional of it. So if I just have some general thing, which is of the form of the integral with some general action, action which is you know of the form you know grad, grad phi squared plus v of uh, plus v of phi, you have the grad phi squared there, which is kind of giving you a, a Gaussian free field already. And then you have the, the some some sort of functional of that. So like uh, for what v's do you think you're you can at least start start your programs. Right? Yes, okay, you want to, to put, uh, well the question is a, is a very tough one actually uh, because you, should, you 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 want to ask uh, which v can I plug here? Yeah, so I know that you can do the, the, the exponential v basically. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, in order to get what integrability or CFG? Just to make sense of the. Ah. Filter. Oh, oh the filter. there is a whole story that, uh, yeah, that, can, uh, that we understand reasonably well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so there, there, are, there are many uh, potential that you can break here. Then there are various sort of uh, difficulties if you, depending on if you want to uh, regularize actual scale, non scale, blah blah blah. But and another question is uh, if you. Push a bit. Uh, what can you play here to get a uh, conformal field? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, okay, sorry. That, 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 of course, is very tricky because, and, you know, if you have a five to the fourth, you've got to tune it. Yeah. So, you're, so your mass was the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this one is very tricky, actually. Yeah. So, you, 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 don't, you don't, do you know any examples outside of, say, uh, the reveal and maybe the total? But the conjecture is start to go. The, the conjecture is that uh, you, you, should, you should get all the minimal models from. from yeah. Uh, polynomial potentials here, but you have to, to take the right uh, scaling limits. Okay. And uh, yeah, nobody we have unitary ones in this, in this representation. Right? And and yes, and uh, but nobody ever found the critical points right. Or What's that? Nobody ever found the critical critical points to get uh, CFG out of this uh, polynomial potentials, right? Well, I mean, you know, in principle, there there you can tune it, you can tune it so that you you get it, but. You're not defining the. It doesn't define the conformal filter. You have to do another scaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I. What is it? Another mean? scaling. And, and the right scaling, nobody, nobody found. Uh, well, you know, know what it should be, but nobody can prove it. Yeah. I think you can't prove it directly for this. I, somebody, somebody knows what is the the, the correct yeah, tuning. Because, because but it's uh, because it's for same same thing for Ising. If you have a scale, yeah, yeah, it's for Ising. Yeah. Same yeah. But there is no construction of Ising with this with this passing. Yeah. So five four. I think it's five four, right? Five four. Five four. Five four. The same universality class. Yeah, it's fine. But but nobody. Uh... Well, you can show something, but no, you, yeah. you don't. You don't go at it this way. I you go at Ising by by using the fact that it's a completely integrable system computed in terms of free fermions. And this is not this is not obviously free fermions, but as a topic, it should be. I mean, from what I understand, your, your, your approach for showing this thing is basically CFT is to use its integrability in a sense, right? I mean, like to set it up with a Gaussian free field and then to use all this, the structure that you're laying out, laying out, or, or, or do I have it wrong? Like, I mean, exponential is very special. It's, it's, yeah, so you are, the exponential is very special. Because you just look at the classical equation. The right thing is, if you solve minus Laplacian equals e to the phi, yeah, it's already a conformal factor. Right. As if you want a conformal, then, if you want a conformal, I mean, it's sort of automatic. Right? Because what Polyakov discovered. Yeah. So, so you, so it's automatic, the automatic? I guess yeah. Yeah, maybe this partly answers. What's automatic is that you, when you guys proved this a long time ago, is it, is it is conformal, right? Yeah. Is, is you but, 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 but you have a hint that it's going to work because at the classical level, it's already you know conformal. But, but you know it's conformal by. But then you have by, to just by, by just checking transformation. Yes, exactly. Then you have to use yes. up. And now, of course, if I have a five to the fourth there, it's not conformal. No, it's not. Absolutely, <laughs> nothing like it. But but it will be conformal in some limit. But but that's much harder to see. Yeah. And so outside well, the exponentials or some of it. Well, the exponential kind of immediately gives you the conformal. Yeah. yeah but yeah. then outside of that, it becomes highly not true. Well, that's right. open. Yeah, I think that's really the key thing. If you want to do work out something. Work out something where it's not manifestly conformal and it's only conformal to certain very special, you know, parameters and, and scalings, then that's going to be much harder, of course. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you.